Hey everyone, welcome back to Nintendo Prime. Uh, we got three big stories to talk about. Eh, most of this is actually a bit negative, and I you know, I don't like covering negative stories. However, these are some important stories, and also the first one, it's not maybe as negative as it initially sounds because Nintendo's actually doing right by the consumer, and that's always a good thing. It just when you see headlines about this today, it's gonna sound negative from the headline. Uh, yeah, let's just, you know, whatever. Let's get into this. So, the very first story deals with Xenoblade Chronicles 3 uh, Collector's Edition issues in the UK and Europe. So, they have come out today and publicly announced this. So, what you're going to see in all the headlines, that you cannot pre-order the special edition, that Collector's Edition of Xenoblade Chronicles 3 in Europe and or the UK before the game comes out. Now, that sounds bad. You know, we, we had our issues here in the U.S., but it, at least we could pre-order it. You know, yeah, the, the items would be delayed, but we could at least pre-order it before the game came out and get the physical game. You can't even do that in Europe or the U.K., so that doesn't sound good. But then Nintendo actually went into full details about this on Twitter, and it's really not as bad as it initially sounds. Let's see what Nintendo had to say on this. Due to the unforeseen logistical challenges, we are unable to open pre-orders for the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 Collector's Edition before the game launches on July 29th. We apologize for any inconvenience caused. To give customers the flexibility to purchase and enjoy the game at launch, we will now be offering the contents of the Collector's Edition, the soft cover concept art book, steel case, and outer box packaging, as a separate purchase at a price that does not include the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 software. This means you can buy the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 game when it launches on July 29th and have a chance to pre-order the collector's edition contents on my Nintendo store later in September. So this is really good news in general. So they're going to make it the whole collection available to purchase after launch. However, at some point in September, you know, you could just go ahead and buy the game now and, and get those contents later and just buy just the contents at a discounted rate, you know, a, a 60 euro drop or whatever it is drop. I, I look, this ends up being not too bad. We already have to wait in general uh, for us in the United States to get our items. And I, I like this solution a bit better. Why mess around? Why not just let people get the game? Let's worry about the special edition later when we actually have everything collected and we know how many there's going to be and we know how, how we want to handle orders of that. Honestly, this is unfortunate news. I think all of us would love to be able to pre-order it now, get it at launch. I, duh. But also understandable and Nintendo doing right by the consumer by allowing you to just buy the game now and not worry that you're going to have two copies of the game and be paying all this extra money later. So, yeah, I think this just comes down to the fact that Nintendo moved this up two months, uh, but that doesn't mean all the special collector's edition stuff could have gotten moved up two months. Only the game can, so... Is it Splatoon 3's fault? I, I think a lot of people like to point at Splatoon 3 and say, hey, if that game would have been ready... Then this game once it got moved up two months, and then we wouldn't be dealing with all of this. But what do I know? So next up, we have our latest batch of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet leaks from over the weekend. Again, you can skip over this stuff if you're not interested. I can't verify the accuracy of any of this stuff. We're just continuing to cover it as it goes. It does seem like the whole game at this point has been leaked, in particular out of China. That's unfortunate four months before release, but what are you, you going to do? We're just covering it, and you guys can either listen to this or you can just skip to the next topic. Uh, but Pokemon Scarlet and Violet Leaks Part 6, getting this off of Central Leaks on Twitter, says Palmy's evolution is electric slash fighting. Smolov evolves into an olive tree. Fukuoka's evolution is not bipedal. There's no third legendary this generation. Taurus's new form is black. Okay, this might be very disappointing for some. According to the leaker, Wooper and Taurus are the only two new regional forms. There are eight to nine ancient species. Another correction, the leaker replied to a person who was asking about future species, not ancient. That's the first time the leaker has mentioned future forms. We don't know if the leaker is referring to both future and ancient Pokemon as a group. There are 120 to 140 new Pokemon. This includes the ancient slash future species. Ancient slash future species Pokemon can't evolve. 
All gym leaders have a second job, so they're not just gym leaders. One gym leader is a skier. Another one is a streamer. Hey, I know what that's like. There's a new samurai Pokemon. No, the old leaker previously mentioned a Japanese-themed bug, so maybe this is it. The leaker is hinting that the Bisharp gets an evolution, but I'm not going to confirm that for now. Could be that the samurai is actually Bisharp's evolution. The new Pokemon with a hammer is pink. Uh, Pawinard gets a new evolution which is not by Sharp, apparently. Prime Ape gets an evolution. Uh, Misdrevious gets an ancient species. Delaberg gets a future species. A new ghost dog Pokemon. A new coin Pokemon. A new fairy Pokemon. And there's a new bike Pokemon. That's very interesting. Uh, next up for the part seven, the old leaker is back again after after feeling his relevance fading away because of the new leaker. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's basically two main people leaking information, uh, but it's being vague with a lot of details. The old leaker claims that some Pokemon mentioned by the new leaker may be cut and saved for the DLC. They also confirmed that Taurus and Wooper are the only two regional forms for the base game. There are three new dog Pokemon. One of them is the ghost dog mentioned by the other leaker. Uh, there's one new spider Pokemon line. It was teased in the first trailer a hardcore queen gets a future species a pseudo legendary gets a future species another pseudo legendary gets an ancient species a gen 1 pokemon gets a convergent species that turns it from a C pokemon to a ground pokemon a gen 5 bug gets a future species the legendary pokemon are getting ancient slash future species but the leaker thinks they may be safe for the dlc there are two pokemon that get both future and ancient species the leaker seems to imply that the ancient slash future species will be treated as legendaries note a previous version of the last tweet incorrectly mentioned that it was corridon such mirrodon who were getting the species in the dlc we incorrectly assumed the leaker was referring to those but it never was actually specified we have corrected it now sorry for any confusion uh next up we have part eight an existing cactus pokemon is getting something we don't know what exactly the new pokemon with a hammer is a fairy plus another type volcano gets an ancient species galad gets a future species and that's it for that batch and then our final batch which actually came out this morning this is part nine there's no breeding in these games but eggs are still there so it looks like there's a new mechanic Solomons gets an uh, either an ancient or future species leg counts for starters and evolutions four two 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 four you guys can figure out what one goes with which year. i was showing that on screen there's a new earthworm pokemon there's a new ostrich pokemon whose hairstyle reminds the leaker of cleopatra Raid battles are back, still multiplayer. New crab Pokemon. There are three new dog Pokemon lines. They all have evolutions. Some small story spoilers. So again, we always warn you, spoilers. You can't add Corridon or Meterdon to your team until the final boss, even though you can ride them earlier. That's interesting. Uh, you can't use your own team for the final boss. Wow. What? Ponard's new split evolution may be based on the rook, like, you know, a rook from chess. A clarification regarding breeding. The leaker specifically told me there's no Pokemon daycare slash nursery. There's a new mechanic to get eggs. And Magikarp is in the game. Good old Magikarp. So, that's obviously the latest update on the Pokemon leaks. Hey, you know... I'm not one out here that, that cares a whole lot about these leaks. Honestly, for after I state them and edit this video, I basically forget everything I just said because there's so many of them. Some of you guys can't do that. So even though I've been talking about these leaks now for like a week, I don't really remember any of them. So it ends up not impacting my enjoyment of the game. Uh, but I'm one in a million. Let's uh, move on to our next story. So as a gamer, I know that I always prefer that developers communicate more with us about the state of their games about fixes in the games recognizing problems and all of that but i'm also just a gamer right i don't know what it's like to be on the other side outside of small little things i know what people say about my content at times uh there was someone who in my last video did hashtag never trust nintendo prime which i found i actually found it to be quite hilarious since I don't have any sources of my own, so there's nothing to trust in the first place. So, uh, but I get criticism and I, I get, you know, you know, I guess, quote unquote, attacked and have had death threats in the past. Uh, I haven't had a death threat in quite some time, so I'm, I'm probably overdue, knock on wood here. But what I find interesting is when we are making these requests of developers, 
what it's like to be in their shoes, especially as a new game is going to come out or a new game needs patches or whatever. And we have this nice chain of tweets from a developer at Ubisoft. In particular, we're talking about Joe Hobbs, who is a lead prop artist at Ubisoft. And, it, man, I, I, it makes me feel like us gamers need to back off because we're never going to get the communication we want if this is how we behave. Let me get to his thread of tweets here. As a game dev, releasing a game should be the most exciting part, but social media and general gamer entitlement make it a horrid experience for any of us who are public about what games we're involved in. I've received death threats in the past over Division 2. It's unacceptable. The ridiculous part is gamers complain that game devs don't communicate with them. But you know what happens when we do? Destiny 2's recent issues are one example. Then there's fix the game, telling an artist to fix matchmaking and so on. You know, because an artist can totally fix matchmaking. The harassment that game developers receive is utterly disgusting. And I see it in the comments of most devs who say pretty much anything. A few months back, a guy posted about his mother being sick, and half the comments were, get back to work, fix the game. So sure, they want us to be open and communicative, but look what happens when we do. Do any of us who aren't paid to deal with that, you know, CMs, want to go anywhere near it? No. On social media, a lot of game devs won't say what they do because they're scared of backlash. For just working for a specific company, or on a popular game like Call of Duty or Apex, etc. Streamers and content creators that thrive on reaction content and overreacting to things for views make things a lot worse. They have a big audience and they can use them as a whip to throw them into the frenzy. Then direct them at the developers, saying how bad the devs are, etc., etc. And then wonder why they won't interact with them. Those are real people with day jobs like everyone else, and we don't need that bullshit. Sure, a lot of it comes down to complete and utter ignorance of how games are made, the time it takes, the processes involved so you don't break the game trying to change something so Bob can correctly loot his new Call of Duty piece. Last thing I want to say is go read this, and I'll, I'll put links to this down below uh, and to a video on feedback as well. Uh, the sad fact is that most ga game devs go on to uh, go on complete social media blackout for weeks following the launch or whatever they've worked on, and I'd heavily advise it. Get some rest, recharge after the push to shipping the game. People will say toxic stuff no matter what you do. And this is just sad it's just sad these game developers uh who put you know hundreds of hours thousands of hours years of their lives into these games and have to dread when they get close to launch because god forbid they actually have their name attached to the project god forbid they post how excited they are about a game launching people aren't going to leave them alone about any minute thing even if they are unrelated to the problem as an example a, VF a VFX artist being harassed over a matchmaking problem as if a VFX artist has anything to do with a matchmaking problem. There are different people that, 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 are, that are responsible for that that need to iron out those bugs. And you're not, so you're not even directing the criticism at the right people. And you know why you're not? Because not everybody on the dev team is outspoken. And why aren't they outspoken? Imagine that you were talking to the right people about fixing matchmaking. Can you imagine the amount of death threats they would get? Everyone would be like, so you're responsible for this problem. Death threat, death threat, death threat. Can you, can you just imagine a life where we keep asking for game developers to be more, you know, communicative with us, to be more transparent with us. And then in response, all they get, half of their comments, not all, he notes, it's not all of them, but like half the comments will just be shit talking their game, shit talking them as a developer. We've gone over this in the past that calling developers lazy is a stupid term to use because it implies a hell of a lot that you don't personally know. Is a developer lazy if they're slaving away 100 hour work weeks for three straight years? Are they? Fucking lazy? Of course they're not lazy when they're slaving away 
busting their ass to get this game out on a deadline. It doesn't make them lazy because you don't like something or something's broken. You could argue that maybe they needed more time. Maybe they needed more QA testing. Maybe the publisher should allow them to delay the game. Like in the case of, uh, what was that, that, that recent game for CD Projekt Red, right? Cyberpunk 2077. They should have delayed it. It should have been delayed another year or two. It needed more time to cook, but all the bugs in it weren't because the developers were lazy. Maybe there was bad management and other things going on, but it doesn't mean it was laziness. But too often, content creators, which are basically just extensions of gamers, are just putting bigger voices out there to what other gamers are saying, which is fix your game, you're a piece of shit. Like, look, I used to really love watching um, Stephanie Sterling's uh, content, Jim Sterling. And, uh, you know, she's uh, makes amazing content. But after a while, it got a little grating when some of the words being thrown out there. And again, not anything against this personal creator. For the most time, they're, they're very, you know, spot on and on targeting the corporate people, the management people. But every now and then, in the past, we're talking years ago, there were comments about, you know, developers not, not, not you know, pushing this or, or, or lazy at this. And to, to, to you know, Stephanie Sterling's credit, they don't say that anymore. She doesn't say that anymore. But back then, it, it just graded me to hear, as someone who worked in software development, that this was the mentality of gamers. That, hey, it's okay to shit talk people making games. Now, I'm not saying that criticism at times isn't warranted, but you actually need direct knowledge before you can warrant the criticism. You can have overarching criticism at the game, right? There's nothing wrong being critical of different gameplay elements or bugs. You can be critical about that without attacking developers, yelling at them to fix shit that they're not even involved in. Someone posts on social media that they're taking care of their sick mother right now. I'm sorry, maybe talking about a fucking video game is not what that person wants to hear right now. And you can go, then why post that? Because they wanted to let the public know why they're currently not working on the game. Seriously. So they're being open and communicative and transparent that, hey, guess what? I'm not doing any work on the game right now because I'm taking care of my sick mother. And you want to go after them? You want to attack them? You want to just tell fix the game. Get back to work. You stop playing video games and save your goddamn money and go to a different medium. Then if you can't be understanding that real people are behind this, they're not robots. Games are not made by robots. Although there's some AI out there attempting to make games, just like there's AI doing art stuff now. But games are not made by robots. They're made by a few people, hundreds of people, dozens of people, millions of dollars on the line. And there's kind of shit these developers get to act like they're not passionate about what they're doing. You're only in game development if you're passionate about it. Because these guys can go to different industries, different software development industries, and make a hell of a lot more money. They stick in game development because they're passionate about making video games for you. So maybe be a bit more understanding. I know there's a disconnect where gamers don't understand how games are made. That's mostly through your own fault. And I'm saying this because there are plenty of documentaries out there. There are plenty of videos and content and articles everywhere, books even, about what the reality is like inside video game development. And yeah, some of it goes over negative stuff. I'm well aware of the process of game development. It's a little bit different at every company, but the information's out there if you want it. But gamers don't want it. They just want games that work. They want games without the bullshit. They want games without the bugs. And I don't blame you. It's like, <laughs> it's funny. Because you can go to a movie, right? And and maybe you're disappointed. Maybe you're like the Thor Love and Thunder. Maybe you think it's a disappointing movie and you really want to complain. Uh, the people that will mostly get the ire of it will be either the general company, like you want to go yell at Disney or yell at Marvel, or sometimes the director will get a little shit. But people aren't attacking the actual script writers. People aren't attacking the VFX artists. People aren't attacking the actors. But they will go after the director or they will go after the company. And in general, that's probably more responsible. The death threats aren't. But being critical and yelling at them saying, hey, you should have did this better, should have did better, you know, fuck your damn movie. Like You want to say all that to those people? Those are kind of the more appropriate channels to approach because that hits the, the larger overarching um, management. But going after specific people over it.
it's just not it's just not right so yeah we all want you know developers to fix their damn games and 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 all that but that's like they don't work hard that's like they don't pay attention that's like they don't know oh my god matchmaking's a problem you think a company, you know, like making Call of Duty, doesn't know when their matchmaking is broke, doesn't realize they have to fix it. We as gamers just don't fundamentally understand what that undertaking really means. The 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 the, the thirty people that might have to be thrown at it, and the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of work hours and man hours that have to be thrown at this problem to fix it and fix it without breaking something else. Video games are hard to make. They're not easy. I know all of us can go take a Unity class and throw together some simple rollball game in Unity. There's a big difference going from that to Call of Duty, from that to Assassin's Creed, from that to the upcoming Sparks of Hope, from that to Breath of the Wild. There is such a big leap and so many considerations we have to take in. This doesn't mean that video game criticism needs to go away. It just means we need to talk about the game in the general sense and then don't actually specifically target individual employees at the company but rather the overarching accounts example you got a problem with how nintendo's handling nintendo directs don't go scream at miyamoto about it go to the nintendo official twitter account and and lodge your complaint there if you want right or make a video on it and, and just make sure you're correctly targeted don't go after individuals or the person that maybe is presenting don't go after them just l- give your feedback in the right ways without going to the extremes. You know what's going to happen if we keep going to these extreme levels? The developers that are passionate about making games for us will stop being passionate about making games for us because they feel unappreciative. They feel like we don't care. We feel like that they're going to feel like gamers don't like their shit anyways. So why not just run off to an industry that's going to pay you a lot better? Let's go make some mobile phone games. Let's go uh, work at Microsoft or Google working on Gmail or something, right? Like, let's let's go work somewhere else where we're, going, where we're not going to get the shit talk because we're not in the public eye, and we're just going to make a hell of a lot more money. Or we'll just go to, this, to the scummiest parts of the video game industry, making these uh, gotcha mechanic, soul-sucking mobile games because, hey, we can make a hell of a lot more money, and those people playing those mobile games aren't giving us shit. So, console gamers, PC gamers, talk about a bunch of entitled crybabies at times. Not all of us, but some of us. And unfortunately, the minority is extremely vocal, and that's what sticks out. The negativity always rises above the positivity, unfortunately. So to Joe Hobbs, everyone at Ubisoft, uh, everyone at all these game development companies, just know that I really do appreciate what you do. Uh, I've been gaming my whole life. And everything that you have made has made massive impacts on my life in many different ways. Even the memeable bad stuff like Superman 64 wasn't a very good game. Never once thought about going after the developers because of it. I just critiqued the game and kind of laughed at how bad it was and and, and moved on. I think, you know, there are times that we can sort of laugh at some of this stuff. Uh, You know, Cloud Gaming right now. Hey, what happened with Kingdom Hearts? Like, that's... That's embarrassing on Switch, and it's kind of funny. Uh, we can be frustrated and be critical. We don't have those uh, brought over natively, but there's no developers to blame for that. that. That's just simply a decision made at Square Enix, and we could, you know, criticize Square Enix for making that decision. But yeah, it, man, guys. <sighs> Anyways, I'm Nathaniel Rubble Jazz from Nintendo Prime. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll catch you in the next video.